And with that, hello everyone and welcome to this Wyoming Untrapped live event. Tonight is our trap release workshop. I am Aaron, your host, and the whole team here is delighted to have you joining us today. Now to introduce our speaker, we're thrilled to have him. This is Dave Pauley, Director of Wildlife Innovations for the Humane Society of the United States. Dave has traveled the world teaching workshops and rescuing a wide variety of species. Dave began teaching trap release workshops, back, uh, workshops with us in 2004. So uh, Dave, welcome back to Jackson. We're thrilled to have you and um, please at this point, Go ahead and take it away. Thank you very much, Aaron. And thank you to Wyoming on Trap for sponsoring this event. Um, I have been doing these workshops a long time, but they've never been more important than today. The, the platform of traps being used has shifted in the last couple of years since some states have gone to allowing wolves to be harvested. So the sizes are getting bigger and we'll demonstrate that, that there's more challenges out there. And there's also changes in snares. So most of the stuff that we have done for the past decade still applies and is important information for you to have. But we're gonna also mention these changes and how that's gonna shift how you can react in the field so that you can be ready if your pet is exposed to these devices. So with that, um, I wanna introduce my partner tonight, Trapper, and Trapper is gonna somewhat involuntarily demonstrate some of these tools and techniques and what they could do to your live companion animal that you hike or hunt with. Um, the main purpose of this, this is not a, uh, this is an awareness course. This is just to make you aware. It's not to teach trapping. It's not to oppose trapping. It's just to say, these are the devices that are out there and you need to know what they are and how you can react. So it's important that you arm yourself not only with some equipment, but with some information. So whatever state, and I should say that this is kind of a Wyoming-based workshop, but you can share this taped event with your friends and family in any state because these devices don't change much state to state. So, uh, but you should, everybody should get a hold of their trapping regulations and read through them. And there, there's always good information in that you might not know. In the Wyoming one, they have a section on trapper ethics and I'll just read one section. Avoid using traps near heavily used recreation trails. Trail users and their dogs could be attracted to traps. So they have that kind of information in there to tell trappers. And we should remember that same thing for us. If you are gonna recreate with your dog, you should try to find safe, potentially trap-free areas or go there when the, the likelihood of running into these devices is minimal. And we'll talk about that a little bit too. So knowledge you should have. You should also have a good leash because you're going to see the leash is critical in getting out of one of these traps. And when I say a good leash, if you have the complimentary leash from your veterinarian or pet food store or whatever, let's uh, not use that. You need to have a substantial leash, either nylon, leather. But this is my favorite leash that I use for water rescues for hurricanes and it would not work because it has a flotation device that would not fit through the eye. So whatever leash you have, you have to make sure that it will fit through the eye, the eye of these traps. So a good leash. Um, hopefully, this is always easier with all these devices to have two people, so hiking in pairs or groups is also a good idea. And then you should have a, a shirt or a sweatshirt or something to use as a head cover on a shirt you could just use it to, as a muzzle breathing head cover, allows the dog to breathe but it can't see. Always remember, even your dog, your lovely family pet, will probably bite you if you're trying to take this device off its foot or its head. It is in pain and it's gonna react accordingly. So you always wanna comfort the dog, you wanna speak lowly. This is not the time to, uh, to panic. Remain calm tunnel your adrenaline into getting the dog out and you will have some adrenaline when you see how some of these devices work. So that would work. A sweatshirt, same thing. You can just envelope the whole dog with most leashes. You can also use it as a muzzle wrap. So you can put it, whoops, I missed this. You could use it, and you're not trying to tighten it down, you're just trying to top, stop it from biting. And then you can say, it's all right, Trapper, it's all right. 
and get him to calm down and then get that device off. And it will be different for each one of these devices. So I think, uh, uh, well, the other thing is your dog should be trained. Your dog should either be voice trained, be on his leash as much as it can, but it should be voice trained too um, because you have reasonable expectations that you're going to run into uh, maybe a rattlesnake, a skunk, a porcupine, hopefully not a bear, but those are dangers that are natural dangers that are out there. These are unnatural dangers that you cannot necessarily uh, train your dog to avoid, but if you can get your dog to sit, stay, or, or freeze, whatever terms you want to use, when your dog is starting to act excited about a smell, um, you want to get your leash on that dog and back away. So, um, and then the final thing is, no matter which device your, your dog is exposed to, um, you want to present it to a veterinarian. You want to get it and have a complete checkup because it may not be, the, the foot may have gotten caught, but the damage may be on his teeth or his gums. And, and I did want to also mention that I'm using dogs as an example, but these devices can cause a havoc with every species, uh, cat, house cats, uh, feral cats, uh, everything from migratory songbirds, all the way up the ladder to mountain lions, wolverines, and bears, especially with the new larger devices. Um, some of these larger devices you will see will catch and hold an adult deer. Uh, uh, almost any animal that steps in may not be able to get out of these large devices. So I'm going to use dogs as the example because hunters and hikers are the main conflict that happens. But, but these devices affect all animals. And I should mention in the Wyoming regulations, you cannot tamper with or remove a, uh, a game a fur bearer or a predator, but it seems to be allowable, and you should maybe check with your local warden, but it seems to be allowable that the protected species could be released. But I would still confirm that with your warden. Okay, next slide, please. So when you're out in the field, be aware. First thing to be aware of is your dog's behavior. If he's acting excited, if he's smelling something that he's never smelt before, like beaver caster or a gland lure of a bobcat or whatever lure or bait that might be being used, if he's acting excited, get him on your leash and I would back away. You may see things. You may see things like this crow in the picture is a sight attractor for cats or a feather hanging from a, uh, a tree branch or see something like this DVD just uh, flying in the wind and attracting. Those are sight attractors. If you see those things, it's either going to be a trapping situation or a researcher trying to get animals on a camera trap. But no good is, good, no good is going to come out of getting closer. So get your dog on a leash, back away, and go somewhere else. So be aware of all those visuals. Next slide, please. So Wyoming safe dog areas. Wyoming is like a lot of western states. 54% 54, 54 public lands, but of those, there's really only those few places on the screen that are, do not allow trapping for fur bearers. So for that seven months of the year that we'll talk about when fur bearer season is open, you have to watch out on, on, on lands other than these four. Um, for, but, but predator trapping can take place 24-7, 365 on all these properties. Now, Wyoming has designated in the last year a couple of trap-free areas and some special areas for pheasant hunting. But um, these, these two trap-free areas are small, but it's the, they're going in the right direction. Ideally, every county and an area near every municipality should have trap-free areas where people can recreate with their dogs with, and have a realistic expectation to get back to the truck without the truck or car with the animal being injured. The next slide is some areas that are designated for pheasant hunting season. And these areas, they cannot use um, snares or quick killing traps, the conibear type, body grip type traps. They can still have foothold traps there, so they're not totally tra trap free. But again, it's the right trend. It's trying to protect hunters, hikers, and their dogs. And this is the kind of thing we like to encourage you to promote more and for ask for more trap free areas. Okay, so now we're going to go through the three classes of uh, 
animals that are generally trapped or are protected in Wyoming. The first are these fur bearers. And this seven, seven month season, um, basically October 1st to April 30, traps could be out, all of these traps, all of these devices could be out for these species. You'll see badgers is kind of an exception, although they're in the fur bearing list. They're kind of treated like a predator because they can be trapped year round almost anyway. So these seven are the fur bearers seven month season. Then we go to the predatory species. Wyoming's a little unique. They have uh, predators like jackrabbits and stray cats. Um, and that stray cat is actually an interesting point because it is not declared in statute if a cat with a collar on, if your cat leaves your property, most likely it's not protected. It becomes a, uh, a predator species. So you really want to be aware of that. And we have tried to change that a couple times, but it's a tough sell. Um, wolves we're not going to spend a lot of time on, but basically in 80% of Wyoming, wolves are pretty much unprotected and be taken 12 months out of the year. Um, there are some game animal um, areas where the statutes are different, but wolves are the driving animal that is making these larger devices uh, popular. And then the last category is the protected species. And actually, there's a, the, the Fish and Game Regulations has a longer list than that because it includes spotted skunks and ringtails. Um, but these are the animals that don't stop trapping from happening, but they are really encouraging trappers to not catch these animals and they're on a protected list. Next slide. Okay, we're going to go through some of the Wyoming trapping regulations. Uh, I am not an attorney. This is not a law class. This is just going over a few of these regulations so that you understand um, some of the do's and don'ts. So we'll just start. Um, there is no requirement to post trapping in progress signs. Um, on some big parcels, uh, that would be a very good thing. On federal lands, that would be a very good thing because people, hikers and hunters, could go to that area and then make a conscious decision if they want to take the risk of their dog being exposed to these devices. So uh, um, that's something as citizens you can promote in Wyoming and every other state. Private landowner permission is required. Um, that is good because then if you go up and ask permission to hike, um, that rancher or homeowner or property owner can tell you, well, you can, but there's trapping going on. I gave somebody permission to trap. So it's a very good regulation to have. Uh, the trap check laws, this is a very Western thing. There are 35 or 36 states in the United States that have a 24-hour trap check. So it's kind of the norm. The Western states have not gotten there. You can see Wyoming shall be checked once every 72 hours for leg hole traps and once a week, which is up to 13 days for body grip traps and snares. That's a lot of time. And then it depends upon if the clock starts to tick when the first call comes in or when the game warden gets out there and marks the trap. So it can be a very long time. 72 hours is a excruciating long time for any animal to be in one of these devices. Next. Okay, trap ID. Every trap and snare has to have a uh, ID tag on it. Most of them are gonna have a, a PIN number, a personal identification number on them, but some trappers will put their name and address on it. Technically, you as a citizen, as a hiker, are not allowed, the, you, the, the thing is usually wrapped around the chain, you're not allowed to unwrap it to see whose trap it is because that would be tampering with the set. But that does make it easy for Fish and Game to contact the person if there is a violation or a potential violation. So that's a very good regulation. If it doesn't have a tag on it, it's an illegal trap. And, um, and that's important. It is also important that you recognize that it's illegal to destroy, disturb, or remove any trapped snare or trapped wildlife. Um, the key there being that uh, you almost exclusively can remove your own dog from that trap. But if you, after you do that, if you damage the trap or do a search and destroy thing to find other traps in the area, you are taking personal liability. And most fish and game departments will cite people for doing that kind of activity. So just be aware that uh, that that's a regulation. No trapping within 30 feet of an exposed bait, um, five pounds or more. The 30 feet, is, and this is to protect uh, raptors, uh, ravens, crows, magpies, any scavenger species that would come in and eat on a deer carcass. The five pounds is a pretty good piece of bait. Um, some states say uh, uh, 
uh, bait not visible from above to stop all the bird activity, but it's reasonable um, that you want to stay 30 feet away from any large bait because that's going to attract non-targets. Currently trapped can be legally placed on trails or other um, high use areas and that's why they do the warning and the regulations to try to discourage trapping trailheads. It's really uh, a risk for everybody and the same thing um, for you as a hiker or, or hunter. You want to know that you can be walking on a trail to go someplace and not have to worry about traps being close to you. So uh, we probably need a, uh, a set distance and we probably need more areas protected so that, so that uh, you know, your dog can be 50 feet from the trail and not be worried about getting caught in a, in a snare or a body grip trap. Next. License fees, um, it's the same for everybody, whether it's a recreational trapper, a part-time trapper, or a full-time commercial trapper who's running literally hundreds or maybe thousands of these devices. Um, it allows commercial take of fur bears. And this is an important point that when a fox, a coyote, any one of those seven fur bears steps into one of these devices, um, it converts from public property to private property and becomes the property of the owner. Conversely, however, if your dog steps into their device and, uh, and gets injured, that trapper has no liability or responsibility for the injuries to your dog. So it's, it's kind of a, um, a mixed bag of protection, but it's just something to be aware of that uh, they can uh, trap in a, set an unlimited number of these statewide um, for that fee. A conservation stamp not required for fur bearer hunting or trapping. That one I quite honestly don't understand because trappers associations always say they're conservationalists. I, I would hope that they would be happy to contribute to the conservation fund, but, but that's, a, that's the statute as it is. Uh, bobcat, beaver, weasel, squirrels, or muskrats doing damage may be taken at any time. So this, uh, regardless of what category they're in, if they are doing uh, property damage, you pretty much can trap them or get a permit to, to take them. Um, bobcats are the only one of those that must be turned into the department. Next. No part of any game animal may be taken or used to bait or poison any wildlife. So if you do see a migratory songbird hanging from a piece of string as a bait, that's illegal. Uh, if you see other things being used, it's better and safer to report it and let it be checked out and see what's going on but uh, no, no wildlife is supposed to be used for bait. So another unusual Wyoming uh, uh, rule, for an extra fee, trappers may keep fur bearers alive for domestication or propagation permit purposes. Uh, generally, they do this to collect urine, and they collect urine for bait to trap other animals, but that's a pretty unusual statute in, in even Western states. The next one is important. Only department employees or landowners may check traps for ID or release animals. And you can go to the regulations and see if there's exceptions. But it really is important that, that other than getting your dog out of the trap, um, you shouldn't be messing with those devices. Next. Okay, no limit to the number of traps one can set. Many states have limits. Wisconsin is 75, some are 100, some are 150. Um, Western states tend not to have them, and literally, I know longline trappers who are running 800,000 of these devices, and that's a lot of potential danger and damage out there, so you should be aware that there is no limit. All non-target animals must be released unharmed. That's a, another uh, difficult, because really only a licensed vet can determine if they're unharmed, because the damage could be subdermal, could be circulatory, could be damaged teeth, um, but the regulation is saying um, they should be released unharmed, and if non-releasable, notify the department. And it also says in the regulations if an animal's dead, like a, like a deer gets caught in a snare, they have to report that and, and report those animals. There's really few effective restrictions on, on size or placement of body grip traps. Wyoming is a state where a body grip trap like the one here on my left only has to be in one inch of water, and that is a, 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 that's a potential danger for, for hunting dogs, for people who recreate in riparian areas. 
Um, today, I just got an email that Indiana has a totally submerged body grip rule, and they're trying to change it to half submerged. So they're going again in, in the reverse direction of what I would like to see, because a fully submerged body grip trap is very difficult to catch a dog. He's going to swim over it. Half submerged, yes. One inch, you will see slides that uh, any of my dogs, any of my four dogs would swim through that trap in a heartbeat. Um, and then finally, there's no mention of domestic animals, uh, required reporting, veterinary care, or release. Um, so if they catch uh, a cat with a collar, they have no liability to report that cat, to turn the cat in, um, to notify the owner. So again, it's kind of an uh, imbalance of rights and responsibilities. Next, please. And there are no methods um, specified on how to kill captured animals. So the most common is probably a 22 caliber uh, gunshot to the head. With some species, the skulls are valuable, so the trappers do not want to uh, damage the skull. Then strangulation, chest compression, clubbing, or in many instances with uh, water animals and raccoons, drowning. They'll do a trap with a drowning slide. And that is a danger if, you, if your dog gets caught in one of those because the whole system is designed to take them down to deep water. And you'd have to be aware of that. Next. So we're going to talk about trapping hardware. We're going to demonstrate each of these things. A trapper is going to help me. But we're going to start just by showing you a... Come on, boy. You can stay here for a minute. We're going to start just by showing you the devices. And we're going to go snares, footholds, body grips because that always used to be uh, the easiest way to do it because snares were pretty easy to do. So I have a snare hanging right here, and that's pretty much what it looks like, and you're going to see, um, you're going to see some examples of that. But snares, uh, when they tighten on an animal, like our little bobcat here, they would tighten on it, and it, it is designed to strangulate the animal. Um, but if it's your dog, and you'll see this in a video, you can back this off and take it off pretty easily. So I, I give this demonstration now just to tell you that the changing thing is that there are snares that are legal in Wyoming, which are mechanically, mechanical advantage spring-assisted snares. And when this snare tightens up as tight as it goes and the animal pulls, the spring shoots and it tightens it even further. In fact, it tightens it, I may have this on the rest of the night, um, it tightens it pretty well. Oh, here we'll get it off. Um, so, there we go. Um, but the danger with this one is that when it tightens with that spring, about the only way to get it off is to use a cable cutters, and it's going to be so tight on your dog, you're going to have a hard time getting this underneath the thing, underneath the wire. So this is a, and these in Wyoming, if the spring is less than three inches, it's legal. If it's greater than three inches, it isn't. But that three inch difference is huge. It's huge to have that three inch difference. So this is a change on the landscape that we really need to address. And for states that don't have these, I would take a hard line and fight against this mechanically advantaged snare because it makes it so much harder to get a dog out. The benefits of snares have always been that you could back them off. That's always been the benefit. And then the, um, the detriment is that uh, this wolf trap that you see is going to cost 120 bucks. This snare you can make for a buck 20. So uh, trappers can carry 50 of these and three of those, and there's likely to be a lot of snares. And that is one point with snares, too, also, that if you find one, you're probably going to find more in the area. So if your dog gets caught in one, back it off, leash it up, and go somewhere else. Um, okay, I think that snares, and I think we'll go to the next section, I'll cover the rest. Oh, and this is the fourth device that is legal in Wyoming. It's a uh, M44 or coyote getter, and it's a device that's orally stimulated by the animal, and it shoots cyanide gas up into the animal's mouth. It's extremely lethal, and it is, um, uh, only can be set on private lands, and only can be set by either USDA Wildlife Services or one of their contractors. Um, so, if you're on private, if you're on public land next to a big sheep ranch, 
these could be there. So I would avoid public land next to a big ranch um, or talk to the rancher and see if they're being used. But uh, that's one we have, no, we have no alternative for. If your dog sets that off, it is going to die. I did want to say one other thing on, the, on this snare, on the mechanically advantaged snare. Wyoming Fish and Game has uh, ruled that these are legal because they say that they're more humane. And I just want to say, I disagree. I don't think they're more humane. I think they're more lethal. Um, so they're more lethal if a coyote or fox goes in there, and that could be construed as being humane. But if a deer nose, a deer leg, a cow's nose, or your dog goes in there, it's not more humane. It's going to cut into that skin and really be an inhumane uh, thing on non-target animals and on, and on your dog. So just another thing to be aware of. OK, we're going to look at a couple of snares. And we're going to use the arrow to highlight. These snares are almost invisible. And this shows that um, you know, it can be in the trail. Most snares are um, not baited. They're blind trail sets. But they could be set within 35 feet of a dead deer or some other big uh, bait. So just be aware that if your dog looks and he's smelling something, look for these snares and then back off. Go ahead. Here's another one in the winter, highlighting it's almost invisible in the snow. Um, snares stay active. Weather doesn't disable them like they might foothold traps. But um, this is, uh, that's what you might see out there. And they work 24-7, and they can catch anything. They're not very selective. Go ahead. This is a dog that survived a snare, but you can see that, there's, that the snare digs into the skin. If your dog is leash trained, well leash trained, that's a good thing, and he might not hit this. But there's so many variables. If your dog's running full blast on a trail, this is the kind of damage you might expect to see. So we're going to look at a couple of videos uh, combined, and it's going to show how you can back this device up. Um, the first one shows us snaring the dog, and it's going to loop a couple of times. But you can see there's this aircraft cable. There's a locking device. In this case, it's a cam lock, and you just back the pressure off of the uh, cam, off of the lock, and then you can back the snare out. You can just pull it out. So see how she's going to collapse those, take the pressure off, and then the snare just backs up. So we're going to see it again on a, uh, OK, same thing. This is not just one more time showing you the difference. But this is a cam lock. There's at least six different locks. There's a bent washer lock. There's a Gregerson lock. Um, but they're all the same principle. You can just back them off and take the pressure off. So now we're going to look at it off the dog so you can see it maybe a little more clearly. And I should mention, so here's the, here's the lock. We're going to compress the cam, take the pressure off, and then it just backs off. So in all old school snares, this will work. It's a little more difficult if the dog has long hair, but this is an excellent example of how you can back it off. I should also say your dog is not going to be sitting that still. So you should have a leash on it. You should have somebody with a head cover. But this is a really good example of how these, how these devices can be reversed. And if we did not have the mechanically advantaged uh, snares, this would be a classic way to be less concerned about snares. But now we have a new device out there that we have to, uh, have to work with. So that's kind of the thing on snares. Um, there's a lot of them out there. Uh, they can be anywhere. Uh, they can be 24-7. Um, they can be in all different sizes. The ones that we're talking about, this is a fox snare, and this is a coyote snare. So they're different diameters. Oh, the last thing is um, there's really only a couple of devices that cut this cable. And I have one here that's cut. So. Your standard, your standard sidearm cutters is probably not going to cut this. Um, but this is a device that Wyoming on Trap sells, and it took it right off. So uh, it, this is in their kit, and you can see it will cut this. But if it's tight loop, it's hard to get this underneath the dog's fur. So have a good side cutters for snares if backing off doesn't work. And this also should work on the mechanically advantaged snares, but I just have not had the opportunity to see if you can get this underneath the snare. It's going to be a challenge. So that's snares. Um, hopefully you'll have some questions on snares in the, at the end of the program. But for right now, we're going to move to the next device. 
foothold, leg hold traps. I've got a variety of them. We're going to talk about them. You're probably not going to see the device like you see it here. It's probably going to be covered either with mud or earth. Um, but you may see the hole, like in this case. Well, that's a dirt hole set, and the trap is about, well, depending upon the species, 6 to 12 inches behind that hole. And there may be one trap. There may be two traps. Um, and, and the idea is the animal approaches the hole, puts his nose in the hole to smell the bait, and his feet have to be where that trap's going to be. Any domestic dog is a sucker for these sets because it's a new smell, and they're going to put their nose in that hole and you're going to have a, a yelping dog. So this is the concealed version. So this is a dog in the trap. Again, um, it's a pretty good sized trap. Um, you want to get to this dog, calm them down, uh, get a head cover on them, uh, get a leash on them, and then you can remove this trap. The video in a minute will show you a couple of ways um, to remove this trap. And it's just releasing the springs, taking the tension off, and then I will show you some hands-on with those things. So here's the video. The first shows using your hands, and having gloves on in this situation is really good because you have to depress both those springs. If you do this hand method, when you release it, there's a chance of getting your skin pinched, so just be very careful. The second one shows using your hands, your fingers, to pull the trap back and using your leg, and this is probably a good method because the dog's foot is going to be in there, and you can uh, pull those back. As soon as the jaws are relaxed, the dog can pull out its foot. So you definitely want to have that dog restrained or he's going to take off, and, and you will have a hard time recovering. So, um, and then the third method will show, I'll actually demonstrate, and will show that if you're by yourself and you have your dog, then you can stand over the dog and use your feet to depress those springs, and that would be the third way. But the key is have the dog restrained um, and then release the pressure. You don't have to reset the trap, just break the pressure and get those off. Okay, so we're going to give you a demonstration now on footholds, and I have a variety. They're all basically the same, yet they're unique. So the first one I have here is a little foothold trap set on the table. I don't know if we can see that a little lower. Okay, so this is a foothold, and the dog, the dog steps on the pan, and that's what the trap comes up and captures the animal. And then I'll show you the, the devices, but that same thing, we could break this off and get this off, but this shows you how this trap is short-chained. That's one method for being chained. Another method is they may be on a long chain and grapple where they can pull this out of the bed and then this gets hung up on brush or something later on. But I want to show you the other foothold traps. This is the new beast on the, uh, on the landscape. And this is a wolf trap. Um, it's a heck of a trap to set. And it's a very powerful trap, but I'll just show you. So this is your dog stepping on this. And that trap uh, is just substantial. And I, right now, if my dog were in there, I cannot compress those springs. So I was playing, I think two one-inch dull rods would work. I'm using two trap-setting tools, kind of bear tools, and then pushing down. You can see how the jaw is relaxed. But these are heavy. You can carry two of them. So I think one-inch dull rods, 18 inches or so, and you should be able to compress this trap there my dog just ran away because I didn't have it leashed. But same principle, um, you need something because <laughs> you're going to hurt yourself doing any other thing. So you need some kind of trap setting device. Uh, another example, I'm going to come around and get my tool, do it from the front. This is a little smaller version, but same principle. Steps on it, gets caught, and then this one is my dog, so I'm standing over the dog. I get my feet down, and I get the dog out. So it's that same thing. Um, it might have looked easy to you. It might have looked easy to you with these devices, but it's not because you're not in an exhibit hall doing it with a stick or a stuffed dog. Your dog is going to be whining, crying, barking, uh, biting, uh, defecating, urinating. Um, so 
it's not easy. You need to practice, you need to get used to these tools, and you need to realize that uh, um, definitely if your dog gets caught in those things, come here, traffic. Definitely if he gets caught, you're going to want that head cover. You're going to probably want him on his side. You're going to want to be calming him down while somebody else takes that trap off. And you definitely want to contain him. And again, even though the damage you think is here, the damage could be in the mouth, uh, could be actually anywhere in his body, and probably in his teeth and his gums. So you, you definitely, with foothold traps, you can get them off, but you can have unseen damage. And I think that's kind of the takeaway point. Okay, the last group is the body grip, uh, sometimes called Conibear. Uh, Conibear was the gentleman's name who invented it, Frank Conibear in Canada, and it was designed as a humane, more humane trap, but when he designed them, he was talking about a muskrat mink size trap. This was the prototype, and it truly was a device that worked better than a foothold trap for those species. But then it became this larger uh, version. There's like four different sizes. This is the largest version, and this is the version that kills dogs. According to the uh, best management practices, the BMPs for traps, this trap is supposed to uh, make a dog lethally unconscious within 300 seconds. That's five minutes. So that's really your timeline for how long you have to do this uh, removal. And so we're going to have a video that's really good and shows the uh, leash trap. But before we go into that, I think I'm going to demonstrate so that you know uh, what you're going to be facing. And so this trap has three, I have three safeties on it. Every trap comes with two of these little safety hooks. And it's just a little piece of metal that goes over the springs and stops the trap from springing. So I'm removing safety hook one, I'm removing safety hook two, and then I put, just for my safety and everybody's safety, an extra spring on there to stop the jaws from expanding. I'll take that off. And so now this trap is fully armed, and this is the trap that only needs in Wyoming to have one inch of water on it. It's a trap that um, can be set in different setbacks, uh, buckets, um, things that are supposed to discourage a dog from going in, but really don't do enough of it. And this is the demonstration that Trapper hates the worst, because if a dog, and these are many times baited, many times on trails. Here's the slide showing uh, a legal beaver set in Wyoming, and if your dog is in the water and swims, all those sticks and all that device is designed to get the beaver to swim up that bank. Um, so a dog will do the same thing, and this is what happens. So the dog is coming along the bank, going to swim up, and that is what happens to the dog. He doesn't stay calm. He's going to be flipping and flopping, and you're going to have a very short time to get him out of there. If you have a device, you can use the tongs. We're going to show you the other method, but you can use a tongs like this, compress that spring. Again, it's going to be more difficult because he's jumping around. And I can get that spring on. And just as I'm going to show you in that demonstration, so I've got one spring off. I'm going to leave the others for a minute. I'll do that while we're watching the video. But right now, this dog is getting some air, and he's going to be making extra body noises, and he's going to be trying to to breathe. Um, I think we'll go to the demo and then we'll uh, come back and talk about this other spring. Oh, those are just a couple slides. I'm sorry, we should show those. These are things to look for. If you see these buckets or boxes out where you're hiking, that's definitely a danger sign. Get the dog away from there. Those boxes are going to have body grips in them. And although they say they will stop most animals from going, most dogs from going in them, uh, a small dog will go in those traps easily. So, and here's another example of a dog killed by a body grip trap and a dog that um, would definitely stick his head in there for bait in a box. Well, watch the video now, and it shows. This is the time where I say to you, remain calm, because your dog just got caught. So here she's using her, her foot and her leash. She's pinning down the leash. 
She's going to point out the two circles on the spring arm of the trap. You go through one, you go, back, go through the second, and then you loop back all the way around and do that again, same way through both, both eyes of the spring. One eye, second eye, and then she does a great job of getting a bite on that leash because this is harder than it looks. So she gets a good bite, and just like I was using the tong, she's compressing the spring. She's looking for that safety pin, that arm. She's getting it on. It's on. Okay, now that dog's getting air on one side of its body anyway, probably reacting. But she just has to remain calm. Again, your dog's not going to be laying still like this. You have to circle around, repeat that activity. At this point, somebody else should be kneeling on that dog, ready to restrain that dog, get a leash on that dog, whatever you can do. Because when the second one, and this spring, she doesn't have to spring all the way. So she's doing the same thing, both eyes. She doesn't need to get the safety catch on this one. She just needs to compress it enough and watch how it relaxes. And as soon as she gets right there, the dog can pull out. And it probably will if it's conscious. So um, this dog needs to be transported immediately to a veterinarian. And you can expect that it's going to probably be there for a couple of days because it's going to take uh, uh, a lot of observation to make sure that cognitively and uh, uh, in all ways a healthy dog before it goes home because some of these dangers and swelling can take a while. Um, so I did the one spring. It's hard on this thing to do the example with the leash because we don't have the setup for it. But again, I'll just show you the setting tongs. I think they still cost about 20 bucks in catalog stores. Sorry, boy, I've got to turn you around so I can do this. But it's that same thing. You're going to compress the spring with whatever you have. I like to use the table. I'm compressing the spring. Again, it's not as easy as it looks. Get the safety device. Trapper's staying real good. Stay trapper. Good boy. I'm scruffing trapper. And trapper is ready to go to the vets for treatment. So. Uh, that's the size. I just want to show you a couple other things with body grip traps. If we can pan over here, this is a smaller size, uh, many times used for raccoons. This is a size used for muskrats, uh, muskrats and mink. People think these aren't dangerous, but if your dog gets his nose on there, it can still do damage. And this one can kill a small dog, I definitely kill cats. So these devices are out there. And you just need to familiarize yourself as much as you can. You need to stay calm, and you need to maybe watch this video three or four times, or bring your friends together when you're going hiking and watch this video so everybody remembers bits and pieces about these devices. OK, so we're going to talk a little bit about first aid. And, uh, uh, but the main thing is uh, shock. And shock is not your worst enemy, because shock allows the dog to uh, calm down, to maybe uh, uh, get in a better healing mode, but warmth and comfort. Um, so quiet, comforting, head cover, warmth, um, and transport that animal right away. Um, bleeding, uh, if, you, if you get bleeding, just like everything else, direct pressure is probably the best way to, retain, to stop that bleeding on the way to the veterinarian, but get some direct pressure, try to stop that. Bleeding in the mouth is much more difficult. Um, so it has to go in right away and be seen for that. Hyperthermia, hypothermia, depending upon the water temperature, depending upon the air temperature, are concerns. So just be aware of those. Again, a blanket is a good thing. Um, having the animal in a plastic airline carrier rather than a metal crate, just all those things to keep the animal's body at temperature um, OK. And then the other thing is that if you're, uh, and I didn't mention this with snares, but with snares, many times, they will constrict the dog and he can't bark. And so your dog could get caught 30 feet away and you don't hear it bark. And you may go back to the car thinking maybe he went back to the car and then he's exposed to all the elements during that time. And uh, so the, with all of these devices, the longer they're in them, the more opportunity for damage. So try to intervene um, as quickly as you can to get the animals out and get them to a veterinarian. OK, so what's the goal of all this? Well, we've accomplished one goal. I think you all know the devices that are out there. And that's the key. Uh, most people do not 
even think that a device like this body grip trap could be set throughout Wyoming um, many times all year long. So we know the devices, you have a little bit of education on how to extract the animals, but we really have to be a little more proactive to that. And we have to advocate for more trap-free zones, places where, you, where hunters and hikers can go and not be exposed to these devices. And also um, signage, saying that the activity is going on. And, and that will be a different hurdle with different agencies. But you definitely want to work to know where trapping is happening, um, to know where trapping is not happening, and to work for some trap-free zones. Okay, um, so Wyoming does have a poacher hotline. I think I mentioned earlier, better to report something and have it checked out than to not report it at all um, because there's, there, the, the regulations are complicated and uh, you should not take action yourself. You should report it to Fish and Game, to Game and Fish, and let them investigate and see if it's a violation. But that hotline is available. Um, you see the deer running there with a the snare, if you see that. Um, if you see a bear running with a, a counter bear or with a body grip or a foothold trap on, you should report that. So this hotline is to get those kind of situations checked out and hopefully resolved. Okay, so we covered the three, actually four devices. Um, I do want to say that uh, the use of these devices is not consistent. Some trappers just like one device more than the others. Some trappers will use all three depending upon the species, depending upon the area they're trapping. Um, so just because you see one foothold trap does not mean there's not snares in the area and vice versa. All of these devices can be set under the same license for the same, same or different species and it's quite likely to see a mixed bag. Um, for your dog, um, size matters. So a smaller dog is less likely to, get, to die from a body grip trap because it can get in there farther. A larger dog, maybe not, but still damage. Um, but all these devices can kill or very seriously injure your dog. These big wolf traps are a, a true setback because they can do a lot more damage to dogs and to wildlife. Okay, so Aaron, if you're with us, I think we're going to go to the questions and see how many of those we can get. And uh, I want to thank everybody for participating and really hope you share this when you get the link with as many people as you can within Wyoming and around the country. Uh, so to jump into it now, the first question we're going to put to you, Dave, is this. If my dog and I encounter traps, is there a forum where we can caution others about the location of active hazards in real time? That's a great question. Um, and I think somebody from Wyoming on trap might get back with you about that proper forum. But there's several things. Uh, uh, you can post at the trailhead. You can write a, a sign and put it up and say, warning, we discovered traps on this trail with the date. And that would warn other people that are coming in. Um, they're probably, depending upon your community, I don't know that there's a statewide forum for reporting that activity, but we will find that out and let you know. But um, you know, the wonders of uh, uh, Facebook and other social media, if you post it on there and say the area and say what you discovered, um, yeah, the word will get out. People will share it with people from that area, and the word will get out that there is a dangerous device in your hiking area. All right, moving right along here, this next question asks, uh, what if I see a trapped predator uh, that is still alive? Can I call game and fish to have them check? Absolutely. Um, uh, and I think you should. Um, definitely, you know, people are, uh, some people might want to go rescue that animal. Legally, that, that may not be appropriate. Safety-wise, it probably is not appropriate. Unless you are dealt with a lot of wildlife, um, a, a coyote, a bobcat, a mountain lion, is not going to cut you any slack, even though you're trying to rescue it. So yes, I would report that. They can find out then if it's a legal set, 
and they can take action appropriately. But it's a very good question, and, and thank you for being concerned about that critter because this isn't just companion animals. This can affect many, many species, Absolutely. including protected animals. Absolutely. And then um, next item here, Dave, what type of trap is my non-hunting dog most at risk to come into contact with? Okay. Uh, well, it depends upon a lot of your, depends a lot on your dog. And some dogs are sight motivated. Some dogs are smell motivated. Um, almost, uh, uh, if you're in a riparian area, if there's water nearby and there's beavers nearby, um, trappers are probably using beaver caster or beaver castorium, which is a gland um, from the beaver. And it is highly attractive to, uh, uh, to almost every species, but especially canines. Um, you may even have some in small, small, minute quantities in some of the perfume that you've worn over the years because it has been used in the perfume industry also. So it's extremely attractive. Um, so, and then size of your dog. Um, small dogs that swim are very susceptible to these large body grip traps. Um, small dogs are probably less likely to go into a snare because they're set higher for foxes and coyotes, higher off the ground and your dog might pass underneath them. So there's all those kind of variables. But if your dog gets gamey, if your dog gets excited when it smells something, it is at risk and you need to, regardless of size, uh, get it under control and try to get it to a safe spot. Very good. And then um, should some... And Aaron, I should... Go ahead, I, Dave. Oh, yeah, I, I was just going to add, if my answers aren't complete enough to some of these people, they do have my email address, and I am happy to, to go into minute detail with them about their particular dog or breed or situation. Happy to do that. That's fantastic. So um, you all have a world-class expert at your disposal here, so feel free to write Dave with any questions after that. And um, I'm going to put this next one here. Uh, if I or someone I know has experienced a trapping incident, who can I talk to about it? Well, well, there definitely uh, Wyoming Untrapped would like to hear about it. I think there's going to be in one of the uh, polling questions at the end, a question that asks if you experienced a negative trapping incident. And that would be the time to report when and where, um, how it was resolved. Um, we hope it wasn't a fatality for your dog and that the, and that the dog um, you know, recovered well. But they would like to know uh, location, uh, type of trap, um, if it was determined, if it was a legal or illegal set, uh, uh, long-term effects on your pet, uh, definitely dental issues affect that pet for its life, affect its digestion, uh, foot injuries uh, can affect a pet forever. So yeah, they want to know. Um, and that also allows them to establish a, a pattern, a pattern of really bad areas. Um, so if it's not reported and not collected, um, it's pretty hard to, to uh, target areas for either trap free or trap notification. So great question, thank you. Mm. And uh, all leashes are not equal, Dave. So um, other than a, a good leash, um, so maybe recommend a good leash and then beyond a leash, what would be one item you recommend you add to uh, a pack? Oh, well, uh, they should also look at Wyoming on trap kit. They have a, a trap removal kit that has a lot of things in it that might be useful. But I think basic first aid, you know, uh, a uh, roll of vet wrap, maybe some gauze um, that can take care of those, any tissue, any bleeding situations. Um, definitely, I already talked about some kind of head cover. In my kit, I just take old sweatshirts and cut the sleeves off, and then that works as a great head cover to get over, allows them to breathe. Um, you definitely don't want to complicate anything and just totally um, cover the dog's head. You want to allow it to breathe through the nose, but you want to cover that, cover the eyes. So, and then, I don't know how you practice being calm, but, uh, s but loud noises, swearing, uh, even crying, your dog is keying into your emotional state, and that's going to affect their emotional state. So I, I think that's, that's hard to add to a kit, but it's, it's important to think about that as you go out there, your goal is to calm this critter down, get that device off, and transport it to a vet. 
So you have whatever can help you do those steps would be important to have. And maybe in your car, if your dog never rides in a carrier, it might not be a bad idea to have an air, airport aircraft carrier, pet carrier in there so it can be confined. Um, or another person who can hold the dog during transport because you do not want it moving around on the way to the vet. Mm. A lot to a lot to think about. And uh, moving yes. into more detail on one specific trap, the wolf trap, uh, can you stand on the wolf trap to release or to relax the trap? Well, uh, you can. This is a beast. I mean, uh, that is a big trap, big jaw. Um, I tried to do it outside just a little earlier, and I stood on the stairs and was able to get my substantial bulk to compress the springs a little bit, but I could not get it to, I could not get it to collapse without using these two devices. So I know maybe there's stronger people than me. I know nobody can do the device we showed by compressing these springs. <laughs> they are just, they are just beefy. So I would say it would be a challenge. If you had three people and two people could get on the side and support the person standing up so that their only job was to compress them, I think you could probably do that. But as a single hiker, um, you're going to need, I think, one inch bell rods, uh, maybe 22 feet long, get them down all the way and do that. Because um, it is, it is, an, it is just, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for me, and I've handled lots of big traps. Then I could, I could compress the springs on these big long springs without a device. But these coil springs, there's four very strong springs, and those four springs generate a lot of pressure. So, uh, I guess my advice would be to avoid areas where there's known wolf activity, um, because that would be a struggle to get your dog out of. Okay, that's um, that's a remarkably strong trap. Uh, three people is something else. So, um, what if I see a trapped predator that is still alive? I um, can I call Game and Fish to have them check on it? Uh, again, that's really your only option um, because they are uh, protected by the administrative rules. You don't have the authority to release it. You don't have the authority to shoot it. Um, so really your only legal option is to report it to Fish and Game. And when you report it to Fish and Game, if you have a GPS on your phone, I mean, give them a good location. Don't tell them, you know, uh, it's by the big tree in that green field. That doesn't do anybody any good. They need to know a pretty darn specific location to come out and find that animal or find that trap. Right. Okay. Appreciate you. I guess that was a, a two for there. People double voted on that one. Um, here's a creative idea. Yeah. Instead of trying to, to stand on the trap and, and go through that whole uh, difficulty, is it possible to, if your dog gets caught in a trap, to pick up the whole trap and just bring it to the vet? And that is a great question. It depends upon the trap and the anchoring method. So if it is, come here boy. If it is a trap like this that is anchored in the ground, this anchor is gonna be impossible to pull out. So the weak link is either the swivel, if you had a bolt cutters, but uh, there was a slide in the demonstration on a beaver trap that had a, a alligator clip that had a, a a clip that was holding. So look for the weak link. There might be a device in here that you can just unclip and take it with you. Um, uh, if it's on a if it's on a drag, yes. If it's wired with wire to a post or a tree, yes, you can unwire it. Um, technically, technically maybe a violation, but I don't think any fish and game agency is going to fault you. And the one time I would suggest that that might be important. If your dog is caught in a trap and it has rocked back and forth and is bleeding, you might want to transport the dog in the trap to begin with because uh, when you open it up, that bleeding could get worse and if you're not prepared to stop the bleeding. And again, it, it depends upon how far away your veterinarian is. If you've got to go 45 minutes somewhere, get the trap off once you get to the car, stop the bleeding, 
if you're five minutes away, or call your vet and ask them, send them a picture of the injury and say, should I take this device off or should I present it? Um, so it's a, there's so many variables, it's an outstanding question. It depends upon can you get the device free to begin with and, um, and, and where is it caught and what is it doing. If it's the body grip or the snare, you definitely want to get that thing off because you don't have time. If it's a foothold trap, it gets a little bit uh, more options. It's actually more options, but you have to act in the best interest of the dog and you have to act with the information that you have. And hopefully you have a cell service and you can talk to your vet. But uh, uh, if it's not bleeding and you can get it off easily, I always recommend getting them off and transporting. But there are situations where transporting with the trap may be a good idea. Mm. Okay, so there's a, there's a lot to think about um, and maybe to better gauge our internal warning systems. Uh, is there a particular kind of terrain that traps are more likely to be set in? Yes. Um, uh, depends upon their species they're after, of course. But in general, if it's a riparian area and there's a creek or a pond, um, there are going to be there's going to be wildlife that comes to that. Um, there's going to be if you're walking up a trail and you see just a whole lot of trails coming off that trail smaller than human trails, um, those are probably wildlife trails. And you're not the only one seeing those. If you drive to an area constantly uh, at night or morning and you're seeing road-killed raccoons or road-killed foxes or eyes of animals running across, uh, again, you're not the only one seeing those. Those areas are probably going to be trapped. So, it ha and, but when you get into sagebrush prairie, you get into where they're trapping coyotes and bobcats, um, it's a little harder. Hopefully those traps are far off the road and far off the trail. But um, anywhere where wildlife is concentrated, traps are going to be found. Hmm. All right. So similar question, but for snares. Uh, what are snares usually attached to? Great question. In Wyoming, they have to be attached to a solid object, so they can't be on a movable object. So I would say um, uh, fence post fences are very common. Um, just like this, this is a, if you can see this snare device, this is a snare on a mounting system, which is a huge 24 inch screw, and it is just screwed down into the earth as an earth anchor, and it can be set anywhere. And almost every snare is going to have these two things. It's going to have this support wire, which just helps hang the snare, and then it's going to have the anchor wire that, uh, so this snare is going to be, just like this, hanging in the open, and it's just attached to a screw that's screwed in the ground. But it could be, it could be nailed to a tree, it could be, it has to be to a immobile object, to a permanent object. Um, so, and generally, these are on trails. So anywhere where wildlife is going, trails on the way to a pond, trails going under a fence, crawl unders, um, that's where these uh, work very, very well. And you could see them. And like the picture showed, thick brush um, with a trail going through it is a place where a snare is going to be. OK. To go from the tactical to the legal, uh, is anyone accountable if they kill your dog. To my knowledge, n not, not criminally. Um, there probably have been some civil actions where people had gone, um, gone after a trapper for, uh, there certainly have been in other states, um, but it's not easy. Um, it's, it's the, uh, the work is put onto the pet owner. There is no, uh, no system that would automatically award damages or costs um, to the dog owner. So not to say that couldn't be changed. Um, definitely, I already talked about that rights and responsibilities thing where public-private conversion, there should be, with that right, there should be some responsibility that if they injure or kill your dog um, uh, while it's legally recreating, there should be some liability. Uh, but that needs to be approached on maybe even outside the fish and game realm, but
but in the total legal realm. So it's a good, it's a good point of discussion and something to pursue, but as we stand today, there's not a mechanism that would automatically make a trapper responsible for injuries or death of a dog mm. or a livestock. No, I, I hope the answer is, is no to this next question, Dave. Um, if my dog is caught in the trap, do I then have to return the trap to the trapper? Well, uh, technically, yes. Uh, the trap is still the property of the trapper. Um, oh, uh, and, and technically, even if you were to destroy or disable the trap, you could be uh, liable for the, for the value of the trap. It really depends upon circumstances. Um, and some device, like if you, if you cut a, a cable on a snare, uh, that you did that to rescue the animal. You had no choice, especially on these new snares where you can't back them up. I don't think you're going to be held responsible for what I, those would be exigent circumstances. You are doing something that you need to do to rescue your dog. I don't think you're uh, responsible. If you transport a dog to the vet, the trap is already off the dog. It, it's in good shape and it gets turned in, smashed or disabled. You're you have exposure. Um, so the answer is um, rescue the dog and then deal with the aftermath after. And, and maybe put the, and rather than the energy of destroying the trap, put the energy into working with groups like uh, Wyoming Untrapped and changing the rules so that uh, that experience won't happen to other people. Mm. Okay, so this was a lot to visualize. Uh, some of us are hands-on learners, Dave. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, doing is learning. So uh, if I live in the Jackson area and I want to practice opening one of these these death traps, really, uh, who could I speak to? Well, definitely talk to Wyoming Untrapped. Um, before, before COVID, we did, used to do these things in this building, and that was the best half hour or 45 minutes of the event because everybody could touch, feel, set. You need to find out if you can even compress that spring by pulling the leash. You need to know if these tongs, you could even do that. So the only way to do that is through community involvement, hands-on, looking at the devices and finding out what your personal options are. And so, yeah, definitely, uh, uh, I think, reach out to them uh, with your location. They have uh, supporters across the state and there can be, uh, 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 safe uh, COVID responsive meetings of a few people getting together and practicing. So, so it, uh, it definitely worth doing. I think the videos that Wyoming and Trap did for this presentation are extremely helpful, but it's not the same as seeing the brute strength of these devices and finding out if you are physically capable of, of wrestling with them. So uh, hands-on mm -hmm. is the key. Okay. So uh, be sure to uh, get in touch with them with Wyoming Untrapped so you all can come in maybe one by one uh, to test your strength and, and get prepared. Uh, now, it was disconcerting to see that very little public land is free from traps, um, or at least trails uh, free from traps. Uh, tell us that trappers can't at least put a, a trap right on a, like a hiking trail. I... I... I wish I could tell you that. Uh, is there some trails that are 30 feet? No, there's no. So Montana has a 30 foot from a center line of a trail thing. Wyoming does not have any restriction. Um, they could legally set the trap five feet off the trail. And that is, for lack of a better word, a little insane because there should be a buffer on any known hiking trail uh, because uh, I hike a lot with my dogs and they cover 50 feet in two seconds. I mean, they're not going to be on the trail. They're going to be exploring. Still voice control for me, but uh, no, there needs to be. That's a great point that there, there needs to be a reasonable buffer zone so people don't have to be looking across every log or trail close to a human trail. There should be definitely some trap-free trails. Mm. So, but if there's a, you know, a, a foot and a half wide trail could somebody put a foothold just right smack dab in the middle of the trail not five feet on but directly on well uh, uh, it has been it has happened yes uh, I don't think 
I don't think most trappers, most trappers would not do that. But if that trapper was walking that in the morning and saw a bobcat or a coon cross the trail at that point, they very well could and legally could put that there. Um, uh, I don't think the, the regulations advised them, I think they even used the term use common sense in the regulations. And, uh, but common sense is a fleeting uh, thing to many people on both sides of this issue. So um, uh, it can be done, it shouldn't be done, but occasionally it is done. And then it also depends upon the type of trail. Um, but if it's a true designated hiking trail, uh, people should have a reasonable expectation to hike that trail without encountering these devices. But right now that is not the case. All the more reason for some mm. civil activism. Yeah. Um, okay, now is there any one keeping track of traffic incidents and it'd be great to see the numbers and the locations and if it is being tracked, uh, how can our, our webinar attendees and future viewers obtain yes. it? Yes, there's a, there's a couple of interesting options here. Some states have a mandatory requirement that veterinarians report trap injuries um, to the state. And that is, those states have usually pretty good statistics because um, most people realize they present their animal to a vet. Uh, and, uh, and that gives good statistics. Here again, we're relying on voluntary reporting. Wyoming Untrapped will take that information. I don't think there's another official website or reporting. I'm getting that, no, there's not, um, but definitely don't just think uh, uh, it's not worth reporting because if that trail or site is having multiple captures, then um, you really need to uh, uh, report those. So. Mm. All right. Well, um, you are giving some great information because everyone is has their eyes and ears glued to you, Dave. Um, so I think there's some credulity around your previous answer about is anybody accountable so we changed the verb here is anybody liable so maybe not accountable but liable to damage done to their vet especially vet bills being what they are yes uh, again at this point no there is no culpability no liability placed upon the person who uses the device um, there are a few states that have that that have a, uh, a requirement but not very many and it is something that if, uh, if you are legally recreating, hunting, hiking with your pets, there should be some uh, liability on the person who placed those devices. You know, I, I will just say, trapping is such a unique activity. It's really, uh, those who fish know that you can only have one or two fishing lines and you cannot leave those fishing lines unattended. Those who hunt know that you can only hunt with one, maybe a rifle and a sidearm, um, and you can't leave those devices unattended in the wild. And with both of those activities, when you catch fish or hunt, you cannot sell that game. You cannot commercialize. You can only do it for self-consumption. So trapping is kind of odd in all those areas where um, they can leave as many of these devices out there as they want. Um, they, can, they can trap a long line and in Wyoming, if they're using snares and body grips, only have to visit those traps once every 13 days. Um, they get commercial gain from the furs. They may also be getting paid for predator control. Um, and yet, they, with those responsibilities and rights, they do not have uh, liability. And again, that's uh, that's not going to happen without extreme citizen activism and, and saying we have rights. Mm. Okay. Um, well, given things are the way they are, uh, this next person wanted to know just about getting out of trouble to begin with. So, do trappers flag their snares to remember where they place them? Uh, and then the thinking there is, uh, how can I key in on the dangers and um, are they allowed to leave a trap at its location forever? Uh, uh, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Um, great question. Um, uh, most trappers avoid 
uh, flagging anything because they feel that that draws attention to their device and that it's going to be stolen or that the fur will be stolen or, or whatever. Um, so very, very little flagging going on. With today's technology, uh, many trappers can GPS locate specific sites and they can keep track of more sets than they could um, when, we used, when they used to do it mentally or with a pad and paper. Um, but uh, uh, no, there is no requirement that they do that. And, uh, and, and I forgot the third part of the question. There was another part of the question. Uh, oh, it, can a trap what? just stay out forever? Oh, uh, do, or do yes. they have to bring them yes. back at some point? Yeah, that's uh, well. If it's a fur, if it's a, okay. Uh, if I set this trap, and I say this is a fur bear trap, this is a fur bear trap, then the fur bear regulations apply to it and can only be set for those seven months. If I say, oh, this is a predator trap, I'm doing predator control, then no, I do not have to bring that trap out. It could be out there 12 months of the year. Um, so the, the ideal would be to control the traps and not the activity or not the species. But uh, that's done in very few states. Um, there's a few states, there's like 10 states that have really good restrictions on traps. And those are states that say, I don't care what you're trapping, I don't care what trap you're using, these are the regulations. They apply to every device. Those, that's a good set of regulations. And not just for us as citizens, but for the game wardens. Because right now when a game warden goes out, they have to determine, is this a legal set? Is this a predator trap? Is it a fur bear trap? Uh, what was the intent? Uh, you know, is, does he have permission? Um, did he get permission five years ago and just assume he had permission every year? Um, you know, there's all sorts of things that come into this. And so the answer is, regulatory-wise, these things could be out there seven to 12 months of the year. Human nature-wise, if a guy, if, excuse me, if a trapper is putting out 1,500 traps, it's pretty probable they're not gonna recover all 1,500. There's gonna be some snares that hang out there and are going to be presenting a danger until some non-target is caught in it. So just know that um, uh, they could be out there all the time. Um, most trappers recover them at the end of their season, whatever that is. And uh, if you find one uh, in the middle of August when fur has no value, it could be a predator trap or it could be a lost trap. So that's another thing you might want to report and say, hey, I just found this thing and there's no season open. Could you check and see if this is a legal set? All right. Um, so, you know, a worst case scenario can happen here, Dave. Maybe it's a, a single hiker or a frail hiker. Um, the dog gets caught in a foothold trap. What do you do if you can't get it out? Okay. I think I used the word adrenaline at least three times. And I will tell you, uh, that 90 pound frail person is probably going to find the energy to get that trap off. I mean, you, it, uh, they won't know until they're faced with it, but I have had people tell me that after the event they tried to repeat it and they couldn't do it. But when their dog was in that trap, they found the strength they needed to get it off. Um, other things that are, I mean, you might look around you and find that there's two sticks that you can stand in one end and push so that you're not doing the thing, so you're not doing it with your hands or your fingers. Um, you might do what the other person suggested is, look at that trap and see if there's a weak link. See if you can disconnect it. Transport it with the trap. Um, you might, uh, uh, if it's a snare, or uh, you might have a cable cutters along and equip yourself for that. So there is no 100% guarantee that you will be able to. In that case, if your worst case scenario happens, hopefully you have a cell service uh, and you can call somebody and get some help. Um, at that point, I would just hunker down, comfort your dog, uh, try to give it some water, keep it hydrated, try to keep it warm. 
and call for help. I, I think that will cover 99% of the situations. But I, but I honestly believe that most people will find the energy and the focus to rescue their dog when they need to. All right. Um, another one, I just, you know, people being aware in the surroundings and trying to find some safe space out there for uh, themselves and their, their pets. Um, this next question asks, generally, how far back in the wilderness do trappers go? I mean, are they, are they going all the way through and through? If you are in five miles deep, is that probably safe? So it's a great and fair question. There isn't a perfect answer. Trappers are like every other group of humans, like hunters. Um, uh, I would say if it's a commercial trapper, commercial style trapper, they're not going back that far because they're running close to the roads and trying to set as many traps as they can. And time is of a concern. Um, if they're trying to catch a, uh, a bobcat or a wolf, yeah, they'll go back there because there's going to be fewer people back there uh, looking for those animals. So uh, those who are recreational trying to catch one of some species, they'll go anywhere. Um, so there is no guarantee. Uh, one suggestion that I haven't covered is that if you have private landowner friends who have a substantial piece of ground, talk to them and say, um, can I come out and recreate on your property if, uh, I will, if you tell me that there's no trapping going on. And private property is, is a pretty honored thing in the West. So most people do not abuse or break that private property bond and a landowner should know if that activity is going on. So, so that's one option. Uh, public land is a totally different thing as we've covered many different ways. Uh, public, public land is multiple use land and multiple use land includes hiking, hunting, fishing and trapping. So uh, uh, unless we work to get those trap-free zones, it's not going to happen on public land. But you could get some substantial private landowners to say, you know, now, and again, there's a downside to that. They don't want 100 people coming out and recreating on their land because people don't always treat the land with respect and close the gates and do that stuff. But on a personal level, if you know a private landowner, you might find a very safe way, place to recreate. Um, that will not have this activity going on. But my goal is definitely every county should have some trap-free space so citizens can go there and uh, recreate without the fear of these devices. Right, and I, I think we just go back to that balance point and um, it seems that some more balance could be, could be found here. Um, just going back to that worst case scenario. Uh, yeah. Maybe people haven't had that, you know, uh, incredible Hulk adrenaline strength. So someone just wrote in again, uh, if my dog is trapped and I'm alone and I can't move the trap or the dog, uh, what do I do? So any more tips around that? Um, yeah. And then, yeah. Uh, First of all, I don't know yeah. if there's, yeah, go ahead. Well, I feel for the, I feel for the person who has that fear because that's going to restrict in of itself their confidence in going out there. And, and that is not the intent is to, make people so fearful that they don't use public land. Um, again, maybe consider whether the place that you're going to has cell service. That might be the, the factor for you that you have to hike somewhere with your dog that has cell service um, so that you have an option to call somebody. Because if you're in true wilderness, don't have cell service, can't open the trap, uh, can't get the dog out, uh, can't remove the trap, uh, you're, you're down to luck and fate of somebody else coming along or uh, camping out and comforting the dog as best you can. Um, there really isn't, I mean, you can get so prepared and you can have the devices, but uh, you try to minimize your exposure either through picking the best pop -up possible place to recreate and to have whatever devices and knowledge you can. But uh, uh, again, worst case scenario can happen. Um, and, and you just have to deal with it the best you can. I, I, again, do think people will find a way, and I do think fate uh, plays a role in, uh, in helping. I have been involved in removing conibear body grip traps from three dogs, 
And in each one of those three situations, I just happened to be recreating in that area and came across somebody with oh, their wow. dog who had been caught. So I think I was fatefully placed there. I can't, you know, so I, I, th I think that things happen and this person, uh, if they really try to target their least risk area, they should be in good shape and to be active to try to change the, change the behavior. All right. And, um, you know, should it happen, uh, someone here did lose a pet or knew someone who did. And so in that situation, uh, this person's friend, the dog was caught very upset in, um, the, uh, Wyoming game fish department's responsibility was just the legal stuff. Is there a support group of, or someone uh, she can call? Cause I got to imagine it's got to be traumatic to watch yes, this happen yes. to a beloved pet. And um, yes. it's, it's going to be a worse day. A absolutely. No, you know, uh, that situation defines post-traumatic stress death disorder. Um, for 13 years, I ran a pet loss support group. I met every Wednesday. And, uh, and I would have people show up. I had a woman show up and described how traumatized she was because she called her cat. She saw her cat and called it. And as it came across the street, they got hit by a car. And she was traumatized mm -hmm. that she was the cause of her cat's death. And as I was comforting her, I said, well, when did this happen? I'm going to get choked up, sorry. I said, when did this happen? And she said, 13 years ago. So for 13 oh, wow. years, this woman had dealt with the guilt that she was responsible for the loss of this animal. I think in this trapping situation, um, I don't know the exact specifics of the one just described, but definitely there's pet loss support groups, um, the local humane societies uh, probably sponsoring those. Um, definitely best to talk about it, uh, talk to a counselor, talk to a pastor, uh, talk to somebody because, and recognize that you are not alone. So, um, uh, so yeah, if there's not a support group, you can start one because you've got the best reason ever to have it and just get somebody mm. involved uh, and, and try to deal with that, uh, that guilt, that post-traumatic stress, because it's real. It, it, it don't, don't go in denial. You, it needs to be dealt with, and you need to uh, recognize that the person probably did at that time everything that they could. Um, and, and understand that in most cases, I think they made the point that fish and game, or game and fish, dealt with the legal responsibilities, and that's probably going to happen today. They, that is their job, is to determine legality, to cite when necessary, and to try to find you know, fairness as they see it. But they are not um, uh, in the pet loss support business, so, so we have to do that ourselves. But I think there's, you know, depending upon the community, there's probably resources. Um, and, and don't, it could be a human loss support group. It could be, you know, a death counselor. It could be anybody, but talk to somebody and, uh, and find out that you are not alone and that, that stress is real. Absolutely. I mean, grief is grief and um, it deserves to be dealt with and not ignored. Um, you've motivated a lot of people here, and I, I'm supposing a number of people have their pens and paper out here. Uh, what is the best leash? I mean, that's okay, uh, well, a great investment. It, yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Quality, quality leash is important. Should be at least six feet long, give or take a couple inches. Um, the nylon web, one inch, one and a half inch. You don't want it so thick that it won't thread through. And the hardware has to be small enough that it will easily pass. If you look at this video again, um, when this comes out, um, the URL comes to you, just take a look at that leash. That was a pretty good leash for fitting through the loops, um, uh, having enough strength. You have to have enough room for your foot to hold it down and to get a bite to pull it. So I think six feet is good. Um, it has to be uh, a leather leash can work, but a lot of leather leashes have big knots in them that might not pass. So it just has to be substantial. There, uh, uh, it has to take a lot of stress, and it has to be able to get a bite on it with your hand so that it's not, uh, uh, you know, like I think the white clothesline rope has been tried, and it's not 
that good because it cuts into your hand and you can't get that strength. So that flat nylon really lets you get a bite. Um, and uh, not that it's a big thing, but it might be a leash that your dog is familiar with. So your dog not thinking it's a strange device. I mean, so if hmm. it's a leash you walk the dog on, it's not going to hurt one bit. He's not probably going to be concerned, but it's a, it's a thing about familiarity. So I would have it be your standard leash. Okay. All right. This person didn't know traps were so common. I think that might be the sentiment of a lot of folks here. Do people typically know? Is this well publicized or is this kind of in the shadows? <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely in the shadows. Um, I, I, and I don't think any state really has an estimate of the number of devices that are out there. They usually know how many licensed trappers they have and they usually can project how many traps and they do surveys and they might ask how many traps a trapper is using. But not all trappers have to be licensed. In many states, landowners can trap without a license. In many states, kids under 16 can trap without a license, youth trapping to try to recruit more people into the activity. Um, and many states uh, do not have mandatory trappers education that, uh, that is critical that they realize that uh, the public uses these lands and and uh, and that you know if they do if they set on that trail they are taking a huge risk and uh, that doesn't benefit anybody it doesn't benefit anybody to set traps inappropriately but they uh, they may be one track minded and thinking about getting fur and uh, and take those risks so there should be all those things um, I will just say in every state if you, every state that I'm familiar with, probably 35 states, there are more devices out there than the state projects because they project conservatively. Um, and uh, uh, those trappers that are commercially motivated, those long line trappers, um, you know, I know one guy in Wisconsin, I'm Wisconsin in Montana, that runs over 2,000 snares, 2,000 snares mm. for one guy for, uh, as a coyote trapper. So. So, you know, that's a lot of exposure from one person. And, um, and then there are, of course, those trappers who run six traps. They're, they were their grandfather's traps and they're doing it on weekends to, for recreation. So, you know, it runs the gamut, but there's certainly not a county in Wyoming that doesn't have these devices out there. And I think there's not a hunting district in the state that doesn't have these devices out there. If there are fur bearers or predators, there are trappers. So um, it's, it's more than you would think. All right, now uh, this person asked, why is Wyoming so behind the times when it comes to trapping? Is it an outlier? Is it behind the times? Are we just the, the oddball state or, um, or give us some no, context I think here? Uh, yeah, great. It's a good question. Uh, I actually should give that some thought, but I'm going to say that uh, Wyoming is probably in line with some other western states, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, North and South Dakota, um, are, are all kind of in the same boat, uh, uh, depending upon species, some are worse. Uh, definitely, they're all protective of controlling predators because they think that's a necessary control. Biologically it's not, but that's a, for another program. Um, so, uh, and some states are worse. Uh, South Dakota for the last two years has had a $5 bounty on the tails of raccoons, foxes, mink, skunks, and badgers year round. They, they run mm -hmm. the trapping season from March until July at the same time that those animals are lactating and have babies. They, they have, and, and they award kids free traps to do it. So, so consider Wyoming ahead of that curve, that, that at least we're not mm. promoting that insanity. Um, and just to give you an idea of the motivations, and this is not to slight anybody, but humane societies in South Dakota are catching raccoons and other animals that are tailless. So the trappers are catching them, cutting the tails off because they're worth money and then releasing the animal so that uh, they can catch it later on when it's prime. So I mean, that's, so I, I don't know if I really said that. I, it's hard to explain 
that uh, hunting and fishing are totally different and the motivation is to get food for the table. No matter how you look at this, trapping has an economic motivation. Um, and, and money corrupts processes, does things. So, so uh, uh, no, I, I think my summary answer to that question is, uh, there are certainly things Wyoming can do to improve. The trends that we saw for identifying some trap-free zones, the trends for identifying pheasant hunting areas where, where snaring and body grips can't be used, uh, are great trends. They need to be expanded. It shouldn't just be snares and body grips. It should be no trapping during pheasant hunting season or a month before pheasant hunting season and a month after because people still recreate with their dogs in those areas. Um, there's just so much. There's... Uh, uh, so much that they could do. They could look at the liability, culpability of, you know, if you can benefit from wildlife, you should be responsible for pets that are caught and injured. So, uh, sure. but in summary, I think that the regulations are pretty good. Um, they need to get better in some areas, but they're trying to educate the trappers. Wyoming Untrapped is trying to educate the recreational users. And that's, it's really all about a continued dialogue. It's all about talking with each other, trying to find compromises, and recognizing that it's to nobody's benefit, nobody's benefit, to have a dog injured or killed uh, while recreating. And so everybody should be able to say, okay, we'll give up this device during this time, at this place. This, these 10 main hiking trails in Wyoming are now tra trap free. You know, uh, the answers are out there, but they're not going to happen without citizens uh, joining groups like Wyoming Untrapped, talking to their legislators. Um, all this law stuff, these are mostly administrative rules um, designed by the Fish and Game Commission, a small group of individuals who tend to be agriculturally and uh, uh, wildlife-based people that need to be not educated, but reminded that there are a lot of uh, people who recreate with their dogs, hunt with their dogs, hike with their dogs, fish with their dogs. You know, we, we really didn't talk about this, but a lot of fishermen take their dogs and their canoes and their boats, and when they get in towards the fishing site, the dog jumps out to swim to the shore. That's probably the most dangerous situation because uh, water sets are a lot less enforced than land sets, and it's very possible there's going to be sets at that fishing site in the water because there's trash cans there, that attracts raccoons, there's human activity, that attracts animals, and a guy can, a person, a trapper can get in there, set a bunch of traps, get out, float the river. So, you know, there's just a, you have to understand what activity you're doing, what your risk factors are, and then try to minimize them. Um, at the same time, just asking for fair and reasonable restrictions. Mm. Okay. Um, so much stuff here to cover. Uh, this one's a very uh, specific question. I don't fully understand it myself, but you're the expert, so um, I'll trust that you do. Are trap snares and conna bears a danger for rescue dogs, maybe in particular? Uh, yes, I don't know if they're talking about search and rescue dogs who are going in an area to find oh. humans. If that's the case, yes, uh, because those areas are tend to be remote, uh, tend to be rugged, and will tend to have uh, devices. So yeah, um, rescue dogs, I, I think a lot of these dogs do have GPS collars on. A lot of the dogs usually are so well trained um, that they will stop at the end of a snare and not fight it. But there's, there's just so many variables. If the snare is set on a slope and a dog is running full speed down the slope, um, he could hit that so hard that it will tighten up and a, a regular snare will tighten up and restrict him. A uh, uh, mechanically advantaged snare will kill him. So, I mean, yes, it, uh, the devices are at, danger, are at risk. Any, any animal in the field. The good thing about rescue dogs is those humans uh, have been exposed to a lot of those risks, and so they're gonna they're gonna read 
if their dog looks crossways, they're going to know what that means, and, uh, and they're going to be on top of it. So hopefully they will have uh, the knowledge and the whereabouts to get their animal out of the trap. Another good, right, these are so, great questions. Uh, yeah, no, our audience is certainly uh, keyed right in here. The, I guess, situational awareness, I'm using almost combat terms here, uh, is a common theme f with these these questions. Uh, pertaining to foothold traps, uh, what does one watch out for? Um, aside from there being a hole in the ground, also yeah. anything in particular during snowfall, snowy seasons versus other seasons? Yes, great question. Snow is actually detrimental to foothold traps. Um, they can cause the soil on top of the trap to freeze and create a crust. Too deep of snow will make them ineffective. So snowstorms actually minimize or reduce the probability of a foothold trap working. They actually increase the probability of a snare working because then those travel trails become all that more energy saving to wildlife and everything gets funneled. So, so you know, different effect by the same snowstorm to different, to different devices. Um, but to answer your question, um, active, I, I think key on the dog's behavior. Um, my dogs, uh, I had tend to have German dogs, uh, wire hairs and, and uh, Weimaraners, and their tail, I just watched their tail, and when their tail goes 97 miles an hour, uh, it means they're, they're onto a scent that they want to investigate. And so I have to go 102 miles an hour to get the leash on them and stop them. Um, I had one German wire-haired pointer that I could tell if he was working a pheasant or a raccoon or a fox just by the way that he behaved because he had a different reaction, different whine, uh, raccoons he would growl. And so you just key into your dog's behavior and see what they're doing. Uh, their nose and their eyes are so much better than ours that they will see things, smell things that we don't. So watch that. And then the last thing is um, think about funnels. Anytime you see terrain making a funnel, that's to shepherd animals into or through a trap. So if you see a bunch of sticks in the ground making a funnel, that, they didn't grow that way. They were placed there to funnel <laughs> that animal to the trap. Oh. So, you know, look for those kind of things. And look for those things hanging in the trees. Look for sight attractors. Uh, most of those sight attractors are for bobcats because cats are, are a sight hunter, whereas canids are a, an olfactory, a smell hunter. But, but they all will be attracted to the same things. So look for things out of place. Look at your animal's behavior. Um, uh, hopefully, at some point, there'll be a database where you can go look and see where this activity is happening. Um, hopefully, in some areas, agencies will decide to put up signs for a trapping activity. And hopefully, there will be some trap-free zones where all of this stuff becomes less important because you now know you have a safe place to recreate with your dogs. Mm. Mm. All right. Um... And uh, this next item here, I'm sure we have all thought it. Uh, it's very straightforward. Simply put, Dave, do dogs actually die? This is awful. Do dogs actually die in traps? Yes. Yes, this is awful. Yes. Dogs actually die. Oh, yes, yes. Wyoming has had uh, uh, cases of dogs dying in snares and body grips. I think, how, how many are we saying? Ten fatalities? Um, uh, on the books of dogs, yeah, it's uh, uh, these devices, body grip traps and snares, are designed as lethal devices. The body grips are supposed to strangulate an animal, cause it to be unconscious in 300 seconds. Doesn't happen that way because Murphy's Law, a lot of things happen. Snares used to be designed to strangulate, now with these power snares, they're designed to strangulate hard. Um, they're designed to cut through tissue that could be a deer's nose or a leg or a cow's nose. Um, so yeah, these devices are more than potentially deadly. They are deadly. Um, so yeah, um, uh, and they're out there unregulated. You know, uh, I, talked, I talked about other devices. I think in the United States it's almost 
50 or 60 years since hunters could leave set traps, set guns out that were tripped and you could have a gun shoot off. Well, well these devices are basically uh, set guns. They're out there to be tripped by some unknown animal at some unknown time. Um, and some states have described them as landmines. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but the concept is that by design, they're supposed to be out there to encounter fur bearers or predators. So yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. Hey, Aaron, I, I do want to give a shout out if I can. Um, sure. You know, we, have that, we have that donate to Wyoming on trap. I work with, uh, with dog protection, uh, trap issues groups in 13, 14 states. And Wyoming residents are, are so lucky to have a group like Wyoming Untrapped who are fighting these battles on a local basis, on a county basis, on a statewide basis. And, and they, they are the mechanism that you can get things uh, changed because they've worked and established respect with the state game agencies and with the commissions. And that's, that's hard to do. So however, either through donations or joining or coming to meetings or distributing this video to as many people as you can, that is what is going to make the difference. Uh, absolutely. Um, and then, uh, Dave, if at any point there's something you want to revisit, a topic that's on your mind that you'd like to share, please uh, go and go for it. Uh, we have about nine, nine minutes or so here. And um, so feel free to have that to do that. Yeah. Uh, next question. Um, I guess we'll another another um, kind of heavy topic is what's the most tra challenging trapping incident you've handled? Oofta, oofta, oofta. Well, it's going to be a little off topic, but I will tell you, um, I was the incident commander at uh, Hurricane Katrina. I spent 51 days in Louisiana and uh, and people responded, rescuers self-responded from 30 or 40 states, came down there with a truckload of traps, live traps mostly, um, set them out all over the landscape, and then they'd get injured or get tired or go home, and they would generate a list that said, uh, trap number two, buy big green house, because all the street signs were gone. And then somebody would come in and say, my, my cat rescuer had to go home, she got sick, and here's a list of her 75 traps that are out there. And we had to go try to find those traps. And we didn't set them. They weren't GPS located. Um, and a lot of dogs and cats died in those rescue traps because we couldn't get to them. So personally, uh, that has gotten me on a long time thing of reform for disaster response. But it's the same issue. It's people setting too many traps. It's people not GPS locating the traps and it's people not going out and recovering all the traps that they set. So there is an analogy to, to this, but, but that one still uh, hangs with me because uh, I found a lot of those animals that, uh, that died in rescue traps. And so, uh, uh, you know, it carries a burden. Um, otherwise, it's been um, the one dog that I, one of the three dogs that I uh, helped get out of a con of bear was an English setter. The guy was a, a falconer, and he was flying a bird, and his English setter got caught in this trap. And we got her out, and she, uh, this was probably 12 years ago, so six years ago, she was still alive, but she was not cognitively perfect. Mm. It, it, it scrambled some cells in her head. Still a lovely dog, had a, had a somewhat decent life, but that trap, that one <laughs> three minute, five minute experience in that device mm. uh, totally negatively changed her life uh, forever on. And, uh, right. and I have discovered dogs that did not survive, dogs that were dead in the traps. And that, of course, is very traumatic when you have to call somebody and say, I found a dog with a tag on. And they go, oh, well, where is he? Where is he? And then yeah, I should have probably started by saying, I'm sorry. I, found a deceased dog with the tag on, but, but uh, uh, it is hard. It is hard to deal with the realities of, uh, and then I will just say also uh, non-target animals. I have taken great blue herons, uh, just about, I don't know, probably 30 different species of animals 
out of traps that were illegal sets or where fish and game asked me to. And uh, usually that ends poorly because uh, you know how frail a great bull heron's legs are. Um, they, they seldom are releasable. So I have placed a lot of non-releasable wildlife into sanctuaries from trap injuries. And, and uh, you know, and that is what it is, but, but uh, it, it takes a toll also. All right. And we couldn't have had anybody better here, Dave, to, to break down this topic, to share their experience. Uh, as an organization, we really appreciate the shout out um, and uh, we feel, you know, blessed that we can be here in Wyoming making a difference uh, to to take care of these traps and get more balance into the equation. I do want to thank Dave once again. Uh, you're a trooper. Two-hour marathon here with physical exercise, <laughs> doing those traps. If they're not easy. We salute you. Uh, to all of you who are watching, there's so many ways to spend a Wednesday evening. We greatly appreciate you being here with us. And thank you for Trapper and uh, Dave's arms there for behaving himself tonight. So uh, this concludes our Wyoming Untrapped workshop. Have a great evening, everyone. And with that, we are done.